Now, Romans, the 13th chapter, is a, a scripture that tells us how to, uh, how to live within a governing authority. And I want us to look at this passage of scripture on this Independence Day weekend, Romans chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. The uh, scripture, as I will read it here together, and then we'll go back and analyze it. The scripture says that uh, every person is to be sub in, in subjection to the governing authorities. But there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection. Not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. As we uh, consider these instructions from the Apostle Paul, we remember that he was writing, of course, to a group of people uh, who lived in the city of Rome, and they were called Romans. And uh, as we bemoan the state of our country and uh, our, uh, our government today, I would have to say that uh, it looks like, as bad as it is, it's still a little bit better than Rome. And uh, Paul was writing in a situation in which uh, things were not a, a, a beautiful theocracy, nor was it a, a world of Judeo-Christian values. Rather, it was a world of excessive government and a, a world of, uh, that was anti-Christian. And yet he writes these words about subjection to the government. And uh, having heard uh, the, uh, the, the ideas and the concepts that he gives, I want us to look back through it and consider some of these things and know how to then apply it to our lives living in the world in which we live today. And and he comes and he says, and I'm reading in the New American Standard today, he says, every person is to be subject to the government. How many of you here are persons? <laughs> Just checking. Uh, actually, uh, literally it says every soul. Every soul is to be in subjection. Now, it's interesting that he, 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 he says every soul. He doesn't say every person as it's translated here. He doesn't say every man as he would tend to do using the, uh, the, 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 uh, the English uh, as same as the Greek that just uh, understood men in terms of uh, men and women. But he doesn't use that, that sort of generic term for an individual or a person, a man or a woman. But rather he says every soul is to be in subjection. Now I think that the reason that he does this is he's telling us something about government. He's telling us that government is a theological issue, certainly a pragmatic issue, isn't it? And uh, we can gather together at the coffee shop and uh, cuss and discuss over government, right? And uh, there's so many pragmatic issues about government, so many personal things about government, but there is a spiritual or a doctrinal or a theological role in government. In fact, I've often thought as I uh, look through my, uh, my theology books in my office and I uh, think back through theology classes I've taken, systematic theology, they have uh, anthropology and angelology and Israel theology and, and uh, demonology and, uh, and uh, theology proper and bibliology and all the ologies that are there, but there's no governmentology. And I think that we really ought to add that into theology because this it really is a soul issue. All the way back into the, uh, the days when Adam, excuse me, I uh, got my guy mixed up, when Noah got off the ark. Adam was not on the ark. Missed it by just a few years, however, if you look. <laughs> But when Noah got off the ark, God said, you know, when Cain, I'm paraphrasing this, this is not a direct quote. He said, you know, when Cain killed his brother Abel, a mark was put upon him that nobody would kill Cain. 
And then Cain had kids. And a few generations down, Lamech, one of his uh, uh, descendants, uh, came along, and Lamech said, Cain killed one, I killed seven. You think uh, Cain got away with a lot? Look what I got away with. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 5, everyone was doing evil continuously. And God cleaned off the face of the earth and went down just to that one family. And he said, now we're going to start a little differently this time. Whenever someone kills a man, his life will be taken from him. Now, that uh, in and of itself uh, requires something, as theologians have looked at that passage, it requires... Government. And so we call that the beginning of the age of government because if you're going to accuse someone of murder and then carry out a capital punishment because of that murder, guess what you got to have? You got to have a judge and you got to have a jury. You got to have some sort of system to figure out who's guilty, how's this going to happen. You got to have someone to wield the sword. And so the age of government began. It's no surprise, by the way, that uh, the next chapter happens to be about uh, the Tower of Babel, which was the biggest government boondoggle ever come to this earth. <laughs> government goes awry very quickly, and government gets out of, its, uh, out of its area of authority. But here's a soul issue. Every soul is to be in subjection. It says to, to governing authorities. That's not exactly a literal translation. What it literally says is authorities above him. Every soul is to be subject to authorities above him. Even the king has an authority above him, right? In fact, even the Supreme Court has an authority above them. And every soul is to be subject to authorities above. Literally, it says to higher powers is the way the King James has translated that very well. And uh, so here is this higher power that is given. Now, going on, it says, uh, to, to the, uh, the, for, it says in verse 1, For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Now, I want you to notice one word there that's very important. It says, those which exist. Which it does not say whom, and that's important. Oftentimes we look at someone in a position of authority and we say, well, God put him or her there into that position. I know I'm going to disturb some of you here with this, but I'll go ahead and disturb you. I've got law enforcement on hand. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think God puts every person in their position. I think uh, the voters do, and the voters sometimes put the wrong guy in the position. I think that uh, perhaps uh, someone uh, comes and there's an interview and it works through the job process and that uh, there's a person who makes the selection and puts someone in that position. But sometimes uh, in the right position is the wrong man. And uh, we can't blame God on that. We blame ourselves on that. He's given us this ability to go to the voting booth and, and uh, select uh, that uh, which we want. But which is correct here? Those which exist. Those authorities which exist. God has established certain authorities in this world. And those authorities really are pretty simple. There's the heavenly authority. There's the spiritual authority that is over all. God is over all. There is the uh, authority of the man in his, in his house. And then there's the authority of the marriage of the man and the woman. And then there is the authority of the government. And in certain cases, there is the authority of the church, which is under the authority of Christ. And these authorities, you notice there's only a few. Have you looked at your tax bill lately? Don't you wish there were fewer? God really has established just very few authorities. And he said, if you will uh, uh, handle life in these authorities which are biblically established, then, and you'll put yourself under the higher authority wherever you happen to be, then life is going to go well. So he says, uh, therefore, whoever resists authority. You, uh, w it wouldn't be Independence Day without a Greek word, would it? So let me give you one. Tasso is the Greek word, tasso. And tasso means to appoint. And here when it says resist authority, 
It's the root word of tasso, to a point. And it has a little prefix that you'll know, and that prefix is anti. Antitasso is the word. Antitasso. That means you go against that which has been tasso, and tasso means what? To a point. You go against that which has been appointed. You're against the tasso. And, so it says here, whoever resists authority, antitasso, has opposed, it says, the ordinance of God. But do you know that word ordinance is also built upon the word tasso? Tasso means to what? To a point. I've got four of you here with me today. Tasso means to a point. Anti-tasso, you're against that which is appointed. And so you, it says here, you reject or you resist authority. But it says you have opposed the ordinance of God. Now, it's built upon the word tasso, which means to a point, good. And the word is actually here, dia tasso, dia tasso. Well, we know the word uh, dia, we use that, that prefix often also. And of course, it means through. And when it's used in front of a word, typically the easiest way to turn out, turn out, uh, or, or interpret it is thoroughly, thoroughly tasso. Now, the word ordinance is dia tasso. It is ordained which is a stronger word than appoint. Why? Because it's thoroughly appointed. It is ordained of God. And so the one who is anti-tasso is working against what God has diatasso, right? That uh, word just to help you out uh, because uh, I, I know you love etymology, don't you? You can look the word up later. Dia means what? Thoroughly. True or Thoroughly. And uh, we get a lot of English words. You can look them up. All the dia words in English, almost all of them uh, that uh, have any kind of Greek origin are uh, like this. In fact, uh, uh, words like uh, uh, diabetic. Uh, we probably have some diabetics here that uh, perhaps could testify to this. And uh, dia, of course, in front of a Greek word means thoroughly. And uh, bemos is, uh, is the word here uh, that it's uh, attached to, dia bemos. You know what bemos means? It means to go. Thoroughly going. And if you look it up, or some of you who have diabetes uh, could probably testify, one of the ways you know you might be a diabetic is you spend all your time in the bathroom. Do you know that's what diabetic means? <laughs> means you are going all the time. <laughs> Thoroughly going. That's diabetic. Dia bemos. Well, uh, then uh, we have the word, uh, for example, diagnosis. Diagnosis. Well, you may know that the Greek word gnosis means what? Knowledge. Diagnosis is to thoroughly know. And so you diagnose something, you come to every bit of knowledge that there is. So uh, diagnosis, you're always in the bathroom. No, excuse me, diabetic, you're always in the bathroom. Diagnosis, you're always in the books. You're thoroughly knowing all that is. If you're a diabetic working on a diagnosis, then you've got plenty of time. But here... The word is diatasso, thoroughly appointed. Now, think about that. The authorities, the governing authorities under which we live, they are thoroughly appointed. Not the individual. The individual uh, may be the, the wrong person that we often have put there, or that mankind in his sin has put there. It may be the right person. It may be the wrong person. But the authority that they have or that that office has is to be respected as a spiritual matter. I read a number of years ago about... Uh, uh, the first uh, President George Bush, that he had a, 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 a sport jacket or a, a, a suit coat that he kept in a, a closet outside of the Oval Office. And when he came, like I am today, and uh, he didn't have his jacket on, he would never go into the Oval Office without stopping at that closet and putting on his suit coat. Because he said, this is the office of the President of the United States. It should be entered into only with the greatest respect. He was a man who understood, whether he made right decisions or wrong decisions, understood that there is a governing authority that 
A man may fill, but a man himself even needs to be in humble subjection to the authority that God has diatasso. He has ordained it. He has appointed that authority. And God has done this in our world. He has appointed an authority. And so, therefore, whoever resists antitasso has opposed the diatasso, the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. This is the first time a personal word comes in here. It's been every soul and every authority, but when a soul goes against the authority, they themselves personally get the condemnation. Verse 3, for rulers, and here again, now we've come to the individual holding the authority, the ruler, the ruler's are not a cause of fear for good behavior. Now, uh, this, uh, the, the, the word behavior, I've circled it in my uh, Bible here, but rather for evil, we could add behavior there. They're not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil behavior. Behavior or works, activity, is the only thing that a government official is rightly concerned with. Behavior. I am concerned that in our world today, government has moved beyond its God-given authority. And it has moved beyond in that it is beginning to judge the thoughts or the heartfelt convictions or the doctrines that, that may be held. And government has a role, and that role has to do, it says in verse 3, with good behavior or evil behavior. It has to do with our activities. I, uh, uh, for uh, many, many years, have uh, been somewhat vocal about being against hate crime legislation. And the reason is that I think that we ought to be against, we, we ought to be against bad behavior. And bad behavior really doesn't matter what uh, fueled that behavior. Because when you get into things like hate crime legislation, the next thing is that you, uh, you, you come to the point that grows eventually to where a man can be punished for simply the hate, for simply the belief. And, of course, eventually, that, uh, that uh, uh, hate where society may universally will say, well, this is hate, and this is uh, bigotry, and this is uh, unacceptable belief, and yet eventually that grows and grows until a man, perhaps, who is just against uh, uh, same-sex marriages all of a sudden can be arrested for being against such a, a thing, for a, his doctrinal belief. So I think we ought to do away with hate crime legislation and just to have a crime legislation. And uh, if you kill someone, you killed someone, regardless of the motive that comes behind it. And so if you have good behavior, then there's, uh, there's, there's no cause for worry. He says, do you want to have no fear of authority? Well, do what is good and you will have praise from the same. Sergeant Hastings, do you ever arrest someone for doing good? I didn't think so, but I wanted to put you on the spot just to double check. <laughs> now, going on in, uh, in verse 4, it says, For it is a minister of God for your good. You know that I uh, am reading from the New American Standard, but I do have a uh, love for the King James, who uh, so often uh, gets it uh, uh, more accurate than any of the other translations. However, I would say here that the King James actually got it incorrect. In verse 4, it says, in King James, it says, for he is a minister of God. And yet, in, in, in Greek, it's very clear. It doesn't say he, it says it. And so it is not a reference here to the ruler of verse 4, but the authority of the middle of verse 4. That authority, it, is a minister of God for what? For your good. The authority of government even. Whatever the higher authority is. You ever resist authority? The authority of the family, the authority of the marriage, the authority of the government. Whatever it is, it is a minister, a servant of God for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. I, again, I think this is something that we ought to teach our boys and girls. When you do that which is evil or that which is against the law, what's going to happen? You need, you need, the word here is phobia. You ought to have a phobia. You ought to be afraid because there is a servant 
that has been ordained of God, and that is servant, in this case, is governing authorities, and they're here for your good, and I might add for mine as well, for the, for the good of the community. But if you do what's evil, be afraid, for it, that governing authority, does not bear the sword for nothing. That tells us that government is to have a sword, right? And it tells us that government is to use that sword. And when are they to use that sword? When there is evil behavior. And by the way, I think this becomes uh, more and more challenging uh, as the years go on because our society has rejected the Judeo-Christian worldview that believes that there is a creator. And if you do not believe there is a creator, then you have a terrible time trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And uh, without a creator, then we all just came out of, uh, you know, as the saying goes, from ooh to you, to ooh to goo to you. And, uh, and there's really no uh, moral difference between a tree and a squirrel and a rock and me. We all just grew out of the same stuff, and matter is matter. It is amoral. But, so as, as we go through that, as you think about that, if matter is amoral, then all you can do is say, what is best for the situation at hand? And when you reject a creator, that's the only source of right and wrong you've got, is let's look for what's best for the situation at hand. That makes a rather uh, difficult uh, uh, journey for a police officer, by the way, to try to figure all of that out. But if you've got a creator, then you look to that creator and the character of that creator, and it is the character of that creator that determines what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. So only by believing in a creator and a creator who has revealed his own character, can we ever even know what is good and what is evil? So, here the sword is not born for nothing. It ought to be used when there is evil behavior. For it, that authority, is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Verse 5, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. Remember, he said that right at the beginning, every person is to be in subjection, every soul is to be subject, in subjection to the higher authority. So it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. Do you remember what tasso means? It means to appoint, that's right. And uh, anti-tasso is to resist the appointment. Diatasso is to be so thoroughly appointed that you're ordained. And here's the word tasso as well. And uh, here in verse 5, where it says to be in subjection, it is hupotasso. Hupotasso. Now, hupo means to be under, to be under the, uh, the appointment. Therefore, it is necessary to be hupotasso. Some are antitasso, and rather they should be hupotasso. You with me? It's a pretty simple uh, uh, explanation here that he gives. So it's to be necessary to be subjection, under subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for, because of conscience sake. Verse 6, it says, for because of this, you pay taxes. Don't you wish you'd have left that out? <laughs> but because of what? Because it's necessary for us to have a higher authority. And in the context here, the higher authority is the authority that wields the sword, and it doesn't do it for anything. But somebody has to pay for that sword, and somebody has to pay for that ruler who's carrying that sword. Somebody has to put all this together. So coming all around, he says, well, guess what? You're going to have to pay taxes. This is what's going to have to happen. And so it is necessary to pay taxes. You can blame uh, Adam and Eve, or if you want to go away a generation, blame, blame Cain on this. He's the one that got the whole government thing started anyway. And so because we've got to have someone to, uh, uh, to wield the sword for the Cains of our society, we've got to pay taxes. For, uh, New American Standard says, for rulers are servants of God. Actually, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the word rulers is not there, and the reference is really to the authorities again. The authority is a servant of God devoting itself to this very thing. That is the very thing of wielding that sword and carrying out its authority. 
So in verse 7, it comes along and it says, Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Then in verse 8, it says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Now, I uh, might just add incidentally that this word, owe nothing to anyone, is uh, not really a, uh, a word about your finances. Uh, it is not a word about going into debt or not going into debt. You'd have to go somewhere else for this. What this says in the context, uh, Paul says, pay your taxes. Pay all of them so you don't owe any taxes. Pay your customs, all of them so you don't owe any customs. Pay your respects in full so that there's not some respect that you should have given that you, you didn't give. But the, uh, you, you pay everything uh, uh, so that the only obligation that you have to these police officers or to the governing authority or to whoever it may be, the only obligation that remains is for you to love them. And that is an obligation, I might say, which can never be fully paid, can it? We always owe to one another to love one another. Now, some, uh, sometimes it's not as easy as others, is it? I uh, uh, every now and then run across a, a, a person that uh, we jokingly, jokingly call uh, EGR. That's an EGR person. Extra grace required. Sometimes it's not so easy to love them, but there is a debt of humanity that we have towards one another, to love them. And when we have loved, guess what? We'll carry out the law. We'll not do that which is evil. We'll have paid all of the debts that we might have for them in any other manner. And in the end, we will, uh, we will be right with all of the higher authorities. Whether that higher authority be the governing authority or it be the uh, family authority, uh, it uh, be uh, the, the community authority, whatever it is, if God has ordained it and we carry out a life of love, then we're going to be able to fulfill the law. Now, if you would uh, turn over just for some concluding remarks, I'd like you to go to the book of Colossians chapter 2. And in a moment, I'll read verses 8 through 10. This week I wrote an article uh, that I entitled Thoughts on a Post-Christian America. Thoughts on a Post-Christian America. In that article, I mentioned a number of things that I'll share with you just very briefly. One of those things that I mentioned in, in that article is that unfortunately, the United States of America that you grew up in is gone. And I am uh, convinced, I hope I'm wrong on this, but I am solidly convinced that it's never going to return. And that there is so much in our world today, a different perspective, a different paradigm, a different worldview than the one that you and I grew up in, except for the youngest here in our, uh, in our congregation, so much of a different perspective out there that we really do not live in the same country anymore. I know it has the same name. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I know it has the same flag. And I know it has the same constitution, though we haven't read it in years. But regardless of all the trappings on the outside, the country that you and I grew up in, that our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, that those uh, pilgrim, uh, with the pilgrim's pride that we uh, spoke of, those alabaster cities gleam, they are totally different than they were before. I uh, remember a song a number of years ago, and uh, it was a contemporary Christian song by uh, the one who then was a contemporary Christian artist named Amy Grant. You remember her back from the 70s, right? And she was talking about small town America in one particular song. And uh, she said in that song, uh, talking about going through the old main street and how it was just empty now. And she had a little line in that song that I'll, I, I'll always remember. She said, you can knock all you want. There ain't nobody home. And as much as we'd like to go and knock on the door of old America and have it come into a world that believes in a creator, 
that believes that God has created all that is and he has uh, created man as the uh, crowning uh, portion of that creation and he's given a man the dominion of the earth and he's given us uh, the, the, uh, the roles of uh, society. As much as we'd like to believe that that world can come back, the truth is it's not there. And for uh, several generations, it took a while to take hold, but for several generations we... We took that away from our children in the educational process, saying that, well, you remember the little picture, don't you, of monkeys growing up to be a man? We said, this is where you came from. You came from a monkey. Now, go act like one. And he did. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we taught our children dinosaurs 65 billion years ago. They died from the earth. And uh, then our children read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and said, well, we got uh, beasts created on one day and people created the next day. I don't understand how all this works together. And eventually, they put that aside and said, well, of course, Genesis chapter 1 is just a myth and legend. It's an understanding of how, uh, of, of, of how one man thought the world came along. But it's just a poetic nature. It's not uh, be, to be given to be understood literally. And along the way, we gave up all of the foundations to a biblical worldview so that you may still hold it today, and I suppose that you do. And you probably have some family and even some friends and neighbors who still hold that view. But the truth of the matter is that as a whole, American society has now come to that tipping point where it no longer holds that view. That makes it a very different nation. And so to uh, expect the same kind of uh, response that America has given in the past, uh, to expect that today, I think is nothing but a dream. Unfortunately, the country that we grew up in is gone, never to return. The second thing I said in that article was that both fear and fight will be useless. I got home last night uh, from watching the fireworks here at the, uh, at, at the church. Uh, well, actually, I watched them here at the church. It was the uh, city of Katy's fireworks. And as uh, I got home, of course, uh, all my uh, neighbors were there celebrating with fireworks. And I walked in, and the dog looked very timid. And I tried to let the dog go out, but she wouldn't go out. And uh, I picked her up and carried her out, and she heard a few fireworks, and she wanted back in the house, and I let her in the house, and she ran immediately under the bed. And uh, I had to crawl under the bed to get her out from under the bed. <laughs> now, you know what? I think there's something within us as we, if you watch very much news, <laughs> we want to hide under the bed, don't we? We're afraid of the world that is out there. I think that fear is useless. Live confident, live free, uh, live within your rights, live uh, happy. You can still buy a watermelon and sit on your back porch and have a good evening. <laughs> live with some freedom in you. Not living in fear about the guillotines that are coming on the trains and about to cut your head off tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. <laughs> Uh, but there's, uh, there's another side that we could live in, in a fight. We could uh, rally the troops. We could have another revolution. We could secede all of these things that I have to tell you there's part of me that is a revolutionary. In fact, I used to read uh, the American history books and I used to say to myself, why was I born in such a boring day? I want to be a Paul Revere. I want to be a George Washington. There's a revolutionary within me. But I also have to say, there's also uh, just enough brain cells left to know that at this point, it's a useless fight. At this point, the tipping point is so far gone that I doubt we could ever win anything like that. Again, maybe I'm wrong on all of this, but fear and fight are useless. Third thing I mentioned, I'll not spend uh, much time on it, but the third thing I mentioned is that large churches, I think, are under the greatest risk today. Because the larger the church, the more the psychological pressure to grow. And if you're trying to grow in a, uh, in a world that is completely opposed 
to your worldview, growth is going to become more and more challenging, isn't it? And so as you sit in the pew, I know that you and I, if you grew up Baptist anyway, I know you have a growth motive. You think we ought to have 10% more this year than we had last year, right? And there's that psychological pressure. We've got to be go or growing. We've got to be growing. Well, guess what that eventually does? Eventually, it causes you to say, we're going to have to quit talking about this or we won't grow. We're going to have to change our views on this or we'll never grow. And you begin to accommodate society. Now, if it's not the psychological pressure, it's the financial pressure. Because the larger the church, the more expensive the light bill. And the more expensive the light bill and the staff and all those other things, the more it is necessary to keep people in the pews uh, giving their dollars, right? And there's this pressure that comes over and over again. I think uh, we may see the day again when it is that little church in which everyone knows the pastor and everyone knows everyone in the church, that that little church is going to be the only one that's able to be faithful in the world that is to come. The fourth thing I said is that evangelism and Bible teaching need to be our focus. In a world in which we live, we need to come together and we just need to say, you know what? We're going to have to teach people who Christ is. We're going to have to introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have to be like that little uh, story that's been told so many times about the, the uh, little boy who was uh, on the seashore and he was uh, picking up clams and throwing them out. And there was, there was uh, hundreds of them, you remember, and someone said, oh, that's useless. You'll never, you'll, you'll never uh, save all those clams. And he picked one up and threw it in. He said, I saved that one. And we're going to have to live in that kind of a world in which we say, by all means, I'll try to win some. And with that, I want to close with Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, and 10, 8 through 10, which says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. And you see the comparison that he gives there. All the world's thoughts, all the world's philosophies, all the world's vain thinking, or Christ. Paul comes along in another place and says, I determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Verse 9, he says, For in him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. <laughs> that uh, is, is beyond what the mind can even begin to comprehend, isn't it? Verse 10. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. Look at those fantastic words of verse 10. In him, you have been made, what? Complete, full. In fact, uh, notice... In him, all the fullness of deity dwells, and in him, you have been made full, or you have been made complete. Now, think about this. If you go, perhaps, to a psychologist or counselor and say, you know, I just don't feel complete. That uh, person will go through all some, some uh, things and say, well, what is, it, uh, what, do you, what is it you feel like you're missing in your life? And all the uh, issues and diagnosis that will begin to take place through all of that. And yet the answer is right here that in Christ you are complete. In Christ is everything. Now, we even in the, in the church uh, don't often get this because uh, we want you as a church, we want you to do stuff that is beneficial to us. And so we'll say, well, if you will join the church, then you'll be complete. I know you've given your life to Jesus Christ, but now you need to join the church. Well, now that you've walked the aisle, uh, we need you to be baptized. Well, now that you've been baptized, we need you to take the Lord's Supper. Now that you've taken the Lord's Supper, we need you to tithe. Actually, we wanted you to do that before any of this. Now that you've given 10%, now we need you uh, to go to a Sunday school class. Now that you go to a Sunday school class, we need you to have perfect attendance. Now that you have perfect attendance, we need you to, uh, to serve on this committee. And now that you serve on this committee, we need you to uh, teach Sunday school. And now that you teach Sunday school, and, and it never ends, uh, we're never really complete because we're always adding something that we have to bring to the table, something that we have to do. 
And yet, here is this, this word that is so unbelievable, we can almost not even accept it. That in Christ, you are complete. It's all you need right there. I hope you'll join the church. I hope you'll give 20%. <laughs> I hope you'll be baptized. I hope you'll teach Sunday school. All those kind of things. They're all nice and well and good, but they're a response. They're service kind of things that you do. And to come together and think that here in this pagan world that we live in, God has given us freely a gift, and that gift is Jesus Christ who came and took my sin and your sin all upon himself. These police officers we've seen have seen more sin, more evil than any one person should have to see in all their lives. And yet all that and more, Christ took upon himself and he paid for it in full upon the cross. And he offers us just by grace an undeserved gift, an ability to come and say, I place my trust in you. I place my faith in you. And then he says, if you do that, doesn't matter how much you know, doesn't matter how much you've done, doesn't even matter what your behavior was, and might I uncomfortably say, it doesn't even matter what your behavior will be. But rather, because of your faith, I'm taking everything that's in you out of you. I am placing completeness within you, the righteousness of God within you, so that having done nothing but receive this gift of grace by faith, you are therefore now complete, complete in Christ Jesus, the one in whom all the completeness of God dwells in bodily form now is yours. Now, friend, if that is grace, then I think we ought to wake up every morning and sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now can see. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it, it, it would be my philosophy that would say that if a man or woman, boy or girl, wants to be complete, here's a list of things that they would have to do for all of their lives, striving for perfection until they came to completeness. But dear Father, that's the vain philosophy of human thinking. And you, rather, have said, I want to give them completeness. I want to allow them to be full instantaneously as a free gift by grace through faith. And Father, I, I, I can't even understand the marvelous, amazing, matchless, um, wonderful grace that we have in this verse when it says, in him you have been made complete. And yet I rejoice in it, Heavenly Father. And I also rejoice that Christ is the head over all rule and authority. I disagreed, dear Father, with what five members of the Supreme Court have done in our society recently and so many other times in the past. That which, for all practical purposes, can never be changed or undone. And yet, Christ is the ruler, and all authority is subject to him. And someday, all that is wrong will be righted, and Christ will be on the throne. And so I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then, in that day, all these things shall be added. Between now and then, I rejoice that I am complete in Christ Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture says, when you know the truth, you are free indeed. And I would invite you today to accept the truth that Jesus has completely paid for your sin upon the cross, that he offers you a gift of total completeness, that you can walk away from this place today complete 
by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd be happy to talk to you individually about it, even right here now during this uh, invitation that we're going to sing. I'll be standing right here and would invite you to, uh, to come speak to me about that or about joining our church or about giving your 20% or whatever it is that you'd like to talk about. I'd be happy to do so. Our altar would be open as well. If you'd like to pray for that, you may just uh, want to uh, uh, rejoice and sing this uh, closing hymn as we go from here today. We'll have some prayer partners in the aisle. Maybe you have a health matter, a financial matter, a relationship matter, anything that you'd like to pray about that you would uh, find one of these who'll stand right in the middle of the aisle and uh, you would uh, visit with them as we close out our service now by standing jim and bob will lead us god of grace and god of grace